what up you lab rats and welcome to whoa i think it's year 2012 because i haven't been on the podcast mic in that long no it's probably been a little bit earlier than that i think probably a year ago but i haven't done a proper like podcast interview since like 2012 so we're going to revamp this and um this was supposed to be a video interview, but like tech likes to do is uh, not work when you <laughs> want it to. So believe me guys, like everything that could go wrong went wrong during this interview. And this is actually the second time that we put together this interview, trying to capture video. And you know what, it's just, it's just really, really difficult, you know? So um, I don't know, usually we don't have this many problems, but we really just had a problem every, <laughs> every which way we turn. However, that is not gonna stop me from sharing this really, really valuable information with you guys. And that is my interview with Greg Smith, Smith the CEO of Thinkific. Now Thinkific is a course uh, host, right? So if you have a course, um, and you want to host them somewhere, Thinkific is really, really, really awesome for that. And I give my own personal testimonial to them on my channel. And um, I got to knowing them through Sid, their kind of VP of growth. And we connected on Twitter. Uh, we had a little Skype chat. And then they became all of a sudden the... Um, <clears throat> the course sponsor for my live event coming up later this year in August, Get in the Lab Live. So we're going to be recording all of the speakers, including myself, um, professionally uh, via Scene Motion Films. And we're going to host all those recordings on Thinkific for all of the attendees. So that is how I got to know Greg from Thinkific. And I said, hey, man, I need to introduce you and your knowledge of courses and how to make courses um, and as well as your platform, because it's just the most simplest, most intuitive, uh, easiest way to put your own courses online um, and and to snowball into more courses like I'm finding out. So the first uh, interface and the first interaction that I had with Thinkific, I was just trying it out. I was uh, working with all the branding because that's really important to me. And then I just started to upload all of my um, my lessons and I just you know one by one by one and it became really really easy and all of a sudden I had like four um, actually uh, four separate courses with over uh, 25 lessons within Thinkific uh, within like a weekend and so it's very very easy very intuitive and that's because the the founders behind Thinkific they understand um, developers speak, but they don't expect you to understand that. So it speaks your language, and I think that's really, really important. So in this interview, guys, that I'm going to show to you, um, you know, I try to cut out all of the, the hinky mess-ups and all that stuff, but you're still going to see and hear, you're still going to see uh, where, where we kind of got cut off or where we had to, you know, continue our conversation, getting cut off again and again. Um, but it's just so valuable. So I'm just going to give you a rundown of what we go through. I talk about, you know, what makes a good course? Is it a really detailed? Is it really short lessons? Is it a lot of lessons? Are you allowed to show transparency? Um, what courses actually do well uh, over their scope of time? Because they've been in business, business for like 10 years. <clears throat> um, he gives me some marketing tips on how to, how to market my own course and how you guys can market your own course. Um, big one is talking about course creation workflow. So how does that break down? What does that look like, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is leaving me. So we talk about price points. That's really a hot one topic. That, I think that's later towards the end. And then we talk about how people buy courses and what their behavior is, which is, I think, a really important component about this whole interview is because, you know, a lot of people buy courses, right? But not too many people finish them. And that's a... That's surprising, and I feel like that's kind of stupid, but at the same time, that's just very human. <laughs> so I'm not calling you stupid if you bought a course and didn't finish it, because uh, ding, 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 I'm the same way. And we talk about that. We talk about the behavior. So um, this is a great interview, guys, for, for those of you who are wanting to put together a course. Um, I have put together my own school of video marketing, which you can check out in the link in the description. And you can see what I've got going on over there. Like I said, I have over maybe 20 lessons going on in the school of video marketing. Plus I have a free one that's going on there also called the free video 
uh, video podcasting course, right? That's three. That's broken down into three very digestible videos for you, for those of you getting into video podcasting. All right, so very cool interview. And um, if you have any questions, comments, likes, uh, feedback for us, please leave it in the comments. And for those of you listening to the end, I have something special for you. So good things, guys. And uh, I hope you enjoy this interview with Greg Smith from Think of It. All right, we can finally get started. Um, all right, Greg Smith, CEO of thinkafic.com. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much. We're doing this for the second time. This is the second time we're at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Meg. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, I was I was saying um, it's kind of a good thing because the first interview we didn't get to go live with it, um, and th- that was kind of funny. But uh, uh, I was saying that you're kind of the first person to be interviewed on the show, on Get in the Lab. And uh, I've done interviews in the past where it was uh, it was a different show that was kind of like three years ago or something like that, two or three years ago. And then I stopped doing that because I was saying, oh, I got kind of bored with it. But now I, I love to bring it back now that I've kind of been in the space a little bit um, and, and gotten reintroduced, reintroduced into interviewing. And interviewing is a very uh, tough skill. So forgive me, uh, lab rats, my interviewing skills are not up to par as some other interviewees, uh, interviewers. Uh, but I want to thank you, Greg, for coming on, and um, I want to give you, Lab Rats, a quick little rundown of how we met. So uh, Greg and I met through um, a mutual connection, which was Sid, and Sid is your your VP, right, Greg? VP of growth, yeah. VP so of he, growth. He helps us grow as a company. Right. So very cool. Like uh, Greg put together, uh, Greg, uh, Sid put together this article called 50 business and marketing books you should read. Right. And so the video marketers cookbook was humbly there amongst uh, many other of my, uh, idols and authors. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and I was, I was so like, uh, kind of like, humbled because crush it is on there by gary v uh for our work week is there by uh tim ferris and those were the two books that really inspired me to get started and so to just be a part of that list was pretty cool and so i hit him i hit up sid on twitter on a direct message i said hey man thank you so much i appreciate that shout out and then i guess that impressed sid and sid you know uh dm me back he said hey man that was clever um and we got to talking a little bit more on twitter and then i said hey i've got a live event going on and i want to host those recordings in some kind of course host thing and so that led me to do a little bit of research and i go hey sid i didn't know that you have a course hosting thingy and i didn't know yet that sid wasn't the the ceo the top the top of the line i didn't know uh that greg was there yet and so (laughs) he goes you know what yeah uh let's work together let's have a skype chat we have a skype chat and that leads me to greg and i say man i got to interview your your ceo right and uh, i was telling you before greg like oh i was a little nervous (laughs) in interviewing the ceo because ceo is such a you know who's (laughs) scary <laughs> and so uh, uh we made it happen and then we recorded uh an interview except we didn't get the video and i'm like dude i gotta get the video because i'm all about video so thank you so much greg i'm catching everybody up <laughs> uh, uh, uh how we met and now we're here finally recording a video a proper video interview uh, with the CEO of Thinkific. So if you can just give the lab rats a little intro into yourself and also Thinkific. Yeah, sure. So Thinkific, we are a platform that makes it super easy for you to create your own online courses. So our mission is really to give you control over your brand, your course, your content, the look and feel, how you want to price it and sell it. And uh, just make it super easy for creators and creative types and uh, instructors, experts, coaches, uh, to create their own course platform. Um, I've seen people create courses in, in a matter of minutes. We had uh, one guy here today who, who took his whole podcasting course and actually put it up in, in under an hour and, and launched it. Um, and, wow. and you can get it on your site under your brand. So <laughs> that's kind of the offering we have. Um, and then my background, I actually started creating my own online course about just over 10 years ago now. And that eventually led us to create Thinkific and, and make it easy for other people to launch their own online courses. And uh, don't don't worry about the CEO thing. I'm also the the, the janitor here every once in a while, <laughs> cleaning up after everybody. So uh, 
<laughs> we don't worry about titles here. Uh, and you mentioned Gary V's book. That's that's. I actually had a chance to meet Gary this week, um, which oh, was pretty man. awesome. Very cool. What was that like? What was that intro like? It was it was insane. It was actually I was, Lewis Howes introduced me to Gary V, which Ooh. is pretty awesome experience. Very cool. Uh, very cool. Yeah. But. Uh, watching Gary uh, is pretty amazing. Like if there's anyone who just gives back and is so free with his time, he, he came out uh, of his hotel and 300 people mobbed him. <laughs> and uh, now he had asked for it because he'd put it out on Snapchat saying, mm. I'm going to be here at this time. But we sat there and watched for about four hours uh, while he talked to every single person who wanted to talk to them. He took pictures with everybody. He did Snapchats with everybody. Yeah. Uh, and, and this was two o'clock in the morning and uh, and he just went non-stop uh, and he had a big keynote address to give the next morning but he's like anything for his uh, audience it's it's pretty amazing to see how much he gives Jesus man I I hope to have that <laughs> kind of energy for my audience uh, but he's on another level that's not something I'm striving for but just to have that passion behind yep. wanting to serve his audience yeah definitely that's an inspiration to me um, yeah as we talk about Thinkific, um, I just want to, uh, you know, you guys are the kind of official core sponsor for getting the lab live, uh, the, the live marketing event that's going on later on this year in August. Um, and I'm, and I'm poking around there and I'm creating even more courses. I went in and I just like pummeled it. I, I uploaded, uh, like 20 some lessons into Thinkific. That was super, super simple. The branding is super simple. And I can't stress enough how how easy it is to use, how intuitive it is. And um, just certain things like, oh, yes, I would want to upsell my other course, or I would want to drip this out. And just like it gets to the nitty gritty. And so uh, Lab Rats, I cannot stress to you enough how easy it is to use. Um, I've used a lot of course hosts over the three years that I've been in the space. And uh, yeah, it's just very intuitive. So I want to thank you guys for, um, you know, not speaking developer speak, <laughs> just speaking <laughs> content creator speak. And even well, though, we're all content creators exactly. here. So that's why like uh, half the people here have their own online courses. The right. one I made 10 years ago is still running. It still generates, uh, you know, five figures monthly. So it's, wow. uh, it's Pretty, pretty nice to have that out there. Very yeah. cool. Um, so at the end, guys, of this interview, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a, a promotion. I know you guys are, are actually giving my book away in this uh, in this article that you wrote, the 50 business books and marketing books that you should read. Um, yeah. I actually sent some books over to Sid just recently, and they just received it. He gave me a little Snapchat. Yeah. He said, thanks, <laughs> thanks for sending me. And I was like, cool, man. You got it. That was super quick. But they're actually doing a giveaway with my book along with uh, Pat Flynn's Will It Fly um, and 13 other books. So go ahead and check that that out the link will be in the description or in this blog post um, and you can uh, I'm, I'm also going to be offering something special at the end of this interview so stick uh, stay tuned for that um, otherwise guys uh, I want to get into it a little bit more let's go content rich with this because um, Greg you come from a course creation background like you said you've had one that's been running for 10 years generating over five figures for you every month that's amazing um, so I have a couple of questions because I'm, I'm now creating more courses and getting more into it and focusing more on it. I don't know why I didn't do this like three years ago, but whatever. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning a whole new world with the, with the courses and everything. Um, but I think it's because your platform offers me such a, it's so easy to do it, you know, and so I can move on and really nail it down. So I, I appreciate that. But let's go content rich with this. Let's talk about courses. Um, in the experience that you've had over the years, what what do you think makes a good course? Like, is it super detailed? Is it really short lessons? Is it a lot of lessons that are really short? Is it a lot of lessons that are really long? Like, um, are should we show transparency when we're delivering our courses? Like, say we do a screen flow lesson, yeah. right? I'm showing you. Like, do I want to show my face? Do I want to be animated and still have a, like, um, like an entertainment factor in there? Like, what, what in your experience makes a good course? Yeah, and those are some good questions. So once people actually, I mean, there's the whole sales funnel and flow of getting into the course, which we, of course, make it easy for you to do. But once you get in there, um, we've got a pretty amazing and easy to use course builder. And it it 
it's a little opinionated in that it helps you create courses that are going to be easy for people to use and increase your engagement. Um, but I'm glad you asked about how to make a good course because it is, it is it, a lot of people, I think, focus more on the sales side and gloss over the actual content of the course to some extent. Mm. Um, so it's great to see that you're really thinking about that because it is really important that once people get in there, they're engaged, they enjoy it, they're somewhat entertained, they learn something, they get a result out of it, and they actually finish the course. And you actually see with a lot of other course platforms, the completion rates, say for example with Coursera, are typically 7 to 14%. Mm. So that means literally like about 1 in 10 people who take your course are going to finish it which means they're really not getting the value that you offered them out of it. Yeah. In Thinkific, we typically see 85% or greater course completion rates, which is nice. off the charts for online courses. And a few of the things that really help in doing that is, as you said, small bite-sized videos. So if you're doing a video or a screen recording or anything, two to seven minutes is the ideal length for it, uh, just to focus on that attention span. Now, if you have a topic that takes you an hour to teach, that's fine. Just cut it up into two to seven minute segments. Even if you shoot it as one big video and then slice it up after. I do that all the time. Mm. But people just need a brain break or an eye break every two to seven minutes. And what I, our system automatically inserts a couple of things between the videos just to give them a pat on the back and kind of gamify it as they progress through it, which really helps. But you can also drop in a little quick one or two question quiz. Uh, so you can make quizzes automatically and think of it. Just drop in a couple of quick quizzes between your videos. And I wouldn't make these quizzes hard. They're just kind of, did you watch the video? So mm. if you have a whole video talking about uh, how to bake cookies and one of the things you're saying in there a nu numerous times is um, make sure you use a lot of sugar, <laughs> then <laughs> you might have a quiz that says, should I use sugar in my cookies, right? Or maybe you're doing healthy cookies and it's like, don't use sugar, let's use something else. Right. And then you just have a quick quiz that says, should I use sugar in my cookies? So not, not something super detailed, but just something that anybody who watched the video is going to get. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel like they're learning something. It makes them progress through it. Uh, if you want hard questions, you can kind of save them for sort of the end of the course for the big final quiz or something. But these should be really easy. The purpose of it is more formative assessment, which means they're kind of reinforcing the things that you learned in the video or the lessons and giving you confidence to kind of keep moving along. Mm -hmm. And people will sit and take three hours of course straight not if it's one long three hour video, but if they have lots of little breaks in between and they feel like they're in the zone. And the way you make them feel like they're in the zone is by giving them quick little feedback that's positive along the way. So we do a lot of that automatically for you, but then you can build it in by having short segments, interspersing it with little quizzes. Uh, you can also throw in the discussion. So we have automated discussions in there. Uh, you can have downloads and homework assignments and other stuff. But the really the big thing for me is short bite-sized pieces of content ideally followed by really short, quick quizzes just to make people feel like, hey, I got something out of it. I'm ready to go on to the next one. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So um, that was going to be my focus because I did release a very um, a very good converting like lead magnet called the uh, free video podcasting course but it was an hour long right it was 45 minutes long and that was the that was the kind of the main like feedback was like could you make it more shorter or could you break it up could you break it up and so that's exactly what I did I broke it up I made it even simpler I made it into like three little videos and so I think that's uh, I haven't launched it yet but I I'm, I'm really excited to to put that that out and uh, see what I get with that and what the feedback is for that so um, what ha what kind of courses have you seen that have done really well uh, and think of it and, and even before think of it what what kind of courses um, really kind of stick because we I, I want that I want a course that still <laughs> makes money for me for like 10 years out yeah well um, I mean the one I did that's still generating it revenue is for the LSAT and I honestly haven't touched it in about five years mm -hmm. uh, somebody rewrote some of our email autoresponders the other day but for the most part um, no changes and certainly no work on my part for the last five years. Nice. Uh, so that that's a kind of unique market space because it's test prep. It's hugely competitive, um, but I still managed to do well in it. Um, so, you know, I've seen course topics do well in things like how to pilot drones, how to uh, use Microsoft Excel, how to color comic books, um, hula hooping, uh, legal huh. education, yeah. accounting education, uh, art, tons of really cool art stuff. Hmm. Um, but so really, I don't think that necessarily the subject matter is going to determine your success. What really determines your success is how you 
position that course and how you get out there and market it and are you able to find an audience for it. So the big things if you're looking to ensure that you're going to have success is doing a bit of upfront research uh, with your audience or with your potential audience if you don't have one, asking people if they're even interested in this, doing a bit of research to see what else is out there. And I think a lot of people get intimidated when they see competition out there, but that's actually a good thing. If you want to do a course on how to bake chocolate chip cookies and you Google that and there are no courses on that, that's actually, and there's no books on it, there's no coaching on it, there's nobody paying anything to learn that, mm -hmm. that's probably a bad sign mm -hmm. because it means, uh, you know, there, there may not be a demand for this, right? Gotcha. Uh, if you look around and there's a bunch of other courses out there about podcasting or books on podcasting or things like that, that's probably a good indication that there's a really good market for this. So you actually want to see some competition. Uh, so that's one place to kind of start is just looking around on Google as to are people making money um, you know, ideally is you see people selling books and private coaching and not much on the course side. So you're early in it, but even if there is courses, that's great. Um, then from there, I would reach out to your potential user base. So if you have an email list already or a fan base already, great, reach out to them. If you have nothing going, then join some Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups where you think your audience would hang out. Build a bit of a relationship. Don't just go in and say, hey, I want to talk to people. Start add a bit of value even for a week. And then reach out to some people individually that you've conversed with and say, hey, I'd love to have a chat with you. Um, one thing I've seen that, uh, that a guy named Danny Any recommends around his course piloting is you actually offer them a free coaching call. So you give them 15 minutes, half an hour free coaching. Uh, you're not selling them anything, but at the end of the call of coaching them on your topic, you say, hey, I'm thinking of uh, uh, we're going to be putting together a program or a course around my topic. Uh, is that something you'd be interested in being involved in or purchasing and ask them if they want to, if they would pay for it and you either get a yes, no, or a maybe, right? Mm. If they're a yes, great. Look, we're going to do a, a pilot of this soon. Um, can I sign you up? If they're a no, ask them why. If they're a maybe, ask them why and well, what would it take to, to get you to a yes? If you hear a whole bunch of no's, uh, that maybe is an indication that you're, you're going down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's a great way to start to just kind of confirm, but I've really seen topics for courses do well in all areas and it just comes down to how you're marketing it and positioning it. The other thing I do on the positioning is it's, it's all well and good to kind of wax poetic for six months in a course if it's a university course, say Biology 101, mm -hmm. where the end result is you will know more about biology. But when it comes to online learning, people want to see what is the outcome. They're buying, they're not buying your course, they're not buying your lessons, they're buying what is that outcome. They're buying that and they're buying your brand. So first they have to respect you and your brand and your company or your vision. And then they have to want the outcome that you're promising them. So those are the two things I focus on in marketing a course is the outcome. So let's say we're doing a course on uh, sleep training your kid, um, which is huge value for moms and well, parents generally is um, by the end of this course, your child will be sleeping through the night, 10 hours, 12 hours a night. For a lot of people, that's a thousand, ten thousand dollar outcome. So they they really want that. So it's about positioning it. Not that I'm going to teach you a whole bunch of techniques, but that when I'm done teaching you this and you've implemented it, your kid will sleep through the night. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're buying restful nights. You're buying sleep. You're buying the outcome peace. of a happy baby <laughs> and peace. Uh, that's the outcome that people are buying, and that's what you should be marketing and selling. And that also affects how you design the course. Okay. I start with that when I'm designing a course and I work backwards from it. Could you expand on that by, uh, what do you mean? You start with the, with the outcome first and then you... Could you sure, so let's, it? yeah, let's, let's look at the example of the, uh, of the sleep training. So we're doing a course where the outcome is your baby will sleep through the night. Yeah. So I put that up at the top of my page uh, or Word document or whatever and I say, this is the outcome we're shooting towards. Then I list out a short list of bullet pointed milestones that it would take to get you there. Um, and these are sort of the big ticket items that would take to get there. So typically it's sort of three to 10 things that are going to happen before your kid's sleeping through the night. So um, it might be that you've established a bedtime rhythm, right? For getting kids to sleep through. I, I got a nine month old daughter at home now. So this is big. Ah. For, and she does <laughs> sleep through the night and, and has thanks in large part to my wife uh, since she was about three or four months. Um, so, so yeah, maybe establishing a bedtime rhythm where you do the same thing every night at the same time is a big one, uh, removing any obstacles to them sleeping through the night, 
um, and uh, you know, having a plan to deal with setbacks. Maybe those are your three big milestones. And that might be kind of my, almost like my chapter headings um, or milestones in the course that we're gonna work towards. And then under each one of those, I'm gonna put another set of bullet points of like, what is it gonna take to get to those bullet points? And those, if it's a smaller course, might even come out to be my lessons. So each one could be a two to seven minute lesson, mm -hmm. or they could be topics. And then with each one of those, under each one of those, I might have another set of bullet points, and those are my two to seven minute lessons. So under having a nighttime uh, rhythm or a nighttime ritual, I might have, um, you know, learning options for rituals, selecting the ones that work for you, experimenting uh, or, or, you know, implementing it, and then how to stick to the plan and, and dealing with uh, other priorities like a family dinner or you're out late one night or you want to go see friends or a movie or something like that and it gets in the way of your ritual. So that's maybe five bullet points under my milestone of having a nightly rhythm and then under each of those I might then add another set of bullet points depending on how big your course is. Uh, so say one is dealing with obstacles and you would say uh, or one one of those topics was uh, was uh, options for your nightly ritual and then so I might have a lesson on bath time breastfeeding, uh, uh, the actual putting them in the crib, um, and, uh, and timing. What time do you do this? So now I've got four bullet points under my subtopic, which falls under the milestone, which falls under my outcome. Mm -hmm. And so each and now those four bullet points, I'll probably do a lesson on each of those. So bath time, you know, make sure that uh, maybe it's the same parent every day that starts the bath time ritual that you do it at exactly the same time every day. I'd be talking about this now in a video lesson. I'd have a quick quiz about it. And what this process does is it very, very quickly allows me to flesh out a course curriculum that leads directly to a course outcome that I know people want. And, and it allows me to build a course backwards to that outcome and make sure that when you do all of these things, you will achieve the outcome. Mm -hmm. It also establishes almost a step-by-step -step approach for the learner, and people love that, especially when they're purchasing a course or signing up for a course. If you promise an outcome and an easy step-by-step -step process that if you do all of these steps, and I'm going to show you every one from A to Z, you will arrive at this outcome. That's kind of your, your golden ticket of like, it's just step one through 20, and you'll get to the outcome. That's what you want. That's what you paid for. Here you go. Here's the recipe for it. Gotcha. Okay, cool. That gives me a lot of insight as to organizing all of this stuff that I've learned and I want to put that into a course because I think that's the most overwhelming thing is to organize those thoughts. And so you're right. Yeah. So start with the outcome first and then work backwards in, as far as milestones and breaking that milestone into little lessons and even little ones and then quizzing them along the way to kind of make them feel like, yes, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing the steps to get yep. to this outcome. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, as far as marketing or as far as acquiring people into your course, yep. there's a couple of ways you could do it, right? So we've got the, the very like popular one where you do a webby, a webinar, and then you do some free content there and then you push to your, your course or something like that. What are, what are your, um, I guess, favorite ways to capture people uh, acquire people into your courses. So there's like generating interest in all of this stuff, but actually landing those leads uh, into enrollments. Yeah, and this is definitely a big one and there's a lot of different ways to do it. And certainly there's always sort of the, the, the most popular marketing techniques or tactics at any, any given uh, day of the day of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, I'll send it over to you, but we have a lot of resources on this on our blog. So we have, anytime I see someone doing well with a course, we'll reach out to them. We'll do an interview. We'll find out how they're marketing it. We'll get them to expose as much of their funnel as possible. Um, and we release those on our, on the Thinkific blog. We also do, um, big posts on marketing strategies that we're using that are working well. Um, so just a few of them to highlight them. One, as you mentioned, is the webinar flow. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. One big one I see is uh, starting at Facebook. And initially, if you have no budget, actually just joining a bunch of Facebook groups where your audience hangs out, being super active in those groups, adding a lot of value. And then eventually, as you build relationships, reaching out either to the individual group members or to the uh, 
uh, group owner. And you do have to be careful about doing this. You're not breaking the rules of each individual Facebook group. But if you start by adding value, you're usually pretty safe. Right. Inviting them to the webinar, that's one way to get them there. Or if you partner with the group owner, you can invite them to the web, have them invite the whole group to the webinar if it adds value. Uh, or running Facebook ads that target and go back to people to come to the webinar. The webinar should be value add in and of itself. So it's not just a sales webinar. There's a sales component to it, but you want to add a lot of value on that webinar. So you're not just there selling. You're saying in this webinar, I'm going to give you the top five uh, things that you must do in order to get your podcast up and running. You make sure that you deliver what you promised and it's heavy value add. Then there's a sales pitch of, hey, if you want to learn more, here's my story. Here's where I started. Here's what I've accomplished. Here's what I'm going to teach you. And, uh, and here's where you can get more in my online course. And usually in the webinar, that's where you're actually doing the sale. So you're selling that online course. Um, and we got a great case study about a guy who actually during his webinar, a wasp got into the room and uh, he spent about... 15 minutes of the webinar chasing this wasp around during the live webinar screaming while his whole <laughs> audience stuck around and laughed at him. And at the end of the webinar, uh, he sold 50% more than he ever had in another webinar before. And we're not talking like hundreds or thousands of dollars more. It's, it was big numbers that he was selling additional because of this wasp in the room. Uh, so maybe there's a humor element there that played well. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Like, a, like yeah. an entertainment factor, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So a few of the things that we do, uh, content is huge for us. So we do a lot of uh, blogging. And, and when we blog, it's not just putting out a 300 or 500 or even 1,000 word article. We're like a lot of 5,000 or two to 5,000 word huge content pieces with a ton of research. So I'll have one dedicated person researching and writing for an entire week to put out a blog post, um, which means usually our posts are amazing in terms of value and content. I want to make sure that when someone reads it, they're looking at it, bookmarking it, saving it, sending it to friends and saying, this is amazing. This is everything I need for this topic all in one place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then other people are linking to it and, and as said, sharing it. So that's, that's uh, one big one for us. I think blogs can really kill small entrepreneurs because you end up investing a lot of time in it. And as a small entrepreneur doing a lot of stuff yourself, I don't see a huge return on that. Instead, what I do, and this is what I did when I had my own online course, is I focused on creating uh, high value resources that were more of a permanent resource. So like uh, you know, a larger blog post that's really well researched and a bunch of effort put into it. Uh, sometimes I would even build something into it, like a tool or something like that, or a chart that people could reference. And I found that I have, so with my online LSAT course, I have two key references that I built about 10 years ago, and they drive and consistently drive more traffic each than my whole blog together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, one of them was, uh, one of the resources was driving three to four thousand dollars in revenue monthly just from that one resource page uh, on an ongoing basis. So I, for small business owners, I generally go for the, for the big ticket resource um, items. Um, so that's, that's one technique on the content side. We definitely use the webinars. We do paid advertising. Uh, we do a lot of social, even just getting out, interacting with people, uh, depending on your market, uh, Instagram and Snapchat can actually be amazing. Um, Snapchat's great for the sort of like, uh, 14 to 24, uh, market. Uh, Instagram is, it can be great, especially if there's a visual element. Um, even if there isn't, there's some creative ways. Uh, Nathan Chan at Founder Mags built a pretty awesome Snapchat, or sorry, uh, Instagram feed for uh, founders. Um, Without so being visual? It, well, so I mean, it's, it's, it's for founders. So you wouldn't really intuitively think that that is a visual thing for entrepreneurs and founders. But it's a lot of inspirational quotes with inspirational images um, and he's built up a huge Instagram following just because uh, he found a way to make what he uh, what he's offering um, very very visual for people. So even with these inspirational quotes and stuff. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it it, it kind of depends. Really, what I do is I start with looking for where is my audience hanging out, um, 
and then I go and find them there and figure out how to market to them there. So a lot of a lot of people's audiences on Facebook and Facebook honestly has the best ad targeting out there. Um, and, and so if you find a way to do it organically on Facebook without a budget initially and it works and you make money, then you can put some money into the ads there. Gotcha. Yeah, I run a lot of Facebook ads and uh, that's been my, my main lead generator there. Um, yeah. So going back to a little bit what you said where it's like, where where is your audience um, what are they, what are they really looking for? What's the outcome? Do you, do you believe, I know that there's two schools of thought on this. Do you believe in the sell your course first and then create it later? Or do you do, I, it sounds like you're, you're a proponent for do the mad research first, um, and then create a course and then sell it. Or are you something kind of in between? Uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a few different ways to do it. And it's interesting because I was, um, uh, talking with Sarah Cordner, uh, she does um, teaching people how to create profitable online courses and um, she was writing some content around not pre-selling courses. Now I think it had sort of a specific twist to it um, and then you look at people like Danny Inney at Course Builders Laboratory and he's all about doing a pilot course and sort of pre-selling your course. So, um, But he still tells you to actually create the content that you're selling first. So I think it's dangerous to sell a course before you've built anything. Uh, I also think it's dangerous to build a monster course and then go and try and sell it. Mm -hmm. So I like to go somewhere in the middle and, and essentially eliminate risk for the course creator. And so that, that is to create something smaller. Uh, first is to do a bit of research, a bit of user research, just finding out would you pay for this. You're not selling it, you're just asking would you pay for this, great, you would, okay, so I'll sign you up, we'll, it'll, I'll be back to you in a you know, short period of time. Then create a mini course two to three hours uh, that you can sell and go out and sell that but explain to people this is a pilot it's gonna get bigger it's gonna get better you're getting a deal don't give it away for free because you still need to confirm that they're willing to pay you're getting a deal for this because it's a pilot and you're gonna help me build it which means you're gonna get more of what you want that works you up to the bigger course more high value course now you go out and sell it but you've eliminated the risk that nobody cares about it because you pre-sold it you got people in you got feedback and you use that to improve the course so you're not just going out and saying, give me 500 bucks, I'll build a course and I'll give it to you next month. That's bad because you have the risk of uh, a lot of risk there. And you're not going out and building the epic course and then trying to find a market for it. Uh, mm -hmm. with The sort of Kevin Costner approach of if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Uh, I'd cut it right down the middle, do the research, build the mini course, pre-sell that, uh, and then build the bigger course and go out and sell that. Gotcha. In your experience over the years, we see a lot of the, the 497, 97, 697. What's the most common price point um, that people are using effectively for a, for a, for not a mini course, but for like a full course? Right. So it, it, uh, it answers a little bit. It depends, but then I'll depends, dig in and yeah. give you some more specifics. Um, so I'm kind of in the process because we, we uh, host thousands and thousands of courses on our platform. So I'm, I'm running some statistical analysis on the pricing and I'll have a bit more detail that I can share with you soon. Uh, but just based on what we've seen over those thousands of courses, um, obviously some of the factors that go into pricing are and I hate to start here, you shouldn't price your course on this, but the length of the course. And that's just a gateway, just a tick box to say, hey, it's a 30 minute course, I can't charge $2,000 for it, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, it's an, it, there's eight hours of goodies in there and all sorts of private things, I don't wanna charge $97 for it. Uh, so just taking a look and considering the length of it, and mostly that is, you should be a decent amount of content before you're charging hundreds or thousands of dollars for the course. Once you're kind of past that hurdle, then it's really looking at, at back to that thing I talked about, which is the outcome. As I said, people pay for the outcome. And so it's what is the value of that outcome? So if it's your kids sleeping through the night and your parents who haven't slept more than four hours a night for three months, the value of that outcome is $10,000 or more. Now, it doesn't mean that that is where your price is going to end up, but people would pay for that if they knew for sure that you will deliver that outcome. Mm -hmm. And I, I know people who've paid ten, twenty thousand dollars or more for a sleep trainer to come in and train their kid to sleep through the night or help them with it. So it's really just figuring out what is the value of that outcome. And there's a lot of different exercises you can go through there. A few things you can do to increase the value of your course is 
offer add-ons to it. So you can partner with other people to offer other things. So, um, you know, you could partner with other podcasters to offer their books or their courses or special access. Um, you create a private group. So you have a private Facebook group that adds huge value to your audience that they can talk to each other and talk to you in. You can have private office hours or coaching hours where they bring them into like a webinar scenario and you answer questions. Uh, you can have potentially homework assignments where you're going to check and work on them. Uh, I saw, I was talking to one person recently who have runs a four month course or four week course. And during that four weeks, you have all in access to this person. You can write them as many messages as you want and they will get back to you on everything for four weeks. Mm -hmm. And when it's over, you're cut off, you're done. But they sell that course at a pretty high price because they're investing in you for that whole four week period and they're going to get you to that result. And they have a really good number of people, like 80 or 90 percent of people that finish the course and get the result that they wanted. So it's really about, um, you know, looking at, at the value of that outcome and building from there. So just to get to specific numbers, see lots of courses priced in the uh, sort of 50 to 200 dollar range. Usually those are sort of just the on demand stuff. Um, you see Udemy moving to a 20 to $50 only price range. So you can only price in there. Now they're a bit of a different use case. So I would, you know, I don't generally price that low or, or recommend people price that low for courses unless you have a huge supply of potential purchasers mm -hmm. like Udemy does. Um, then when you get up above the sort of $200 mark, that's usually when you either have a really big course with a high value outcome or you're adding a bunch of these extra add-ons to it. And when you're getting in the sort of thousand to two thousand dollar range, you're usually having all of these extra add-ons, the private groups, the extra help, all that kind of stuff, um, and you've kind of built a brand around it that people respect. Gotcha. And that's when you can start charging that thousand, two thousand dollar mark kind of thing. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, sweet. That gives me so much to go off. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, as we kind of close, learned, uh, come to a close here. What is the most surprising thing that maybe nobody really talks about or that you've learned kind of being on the front end and being a user, being a content creator, and now being in the back end? What's mm -hmm. something that people kind of glaze over or miss repeatedly? Uh, well, the biggest thing that surprises me in the course space is even now after 10 years of being in it with my own successful course is seeing how successful people can be with it. So whether your goal is just giving away courses for free and generating leads and emails and building that um, customer base or that um, family around you. Greg, crap. <laughs> I, I lost you for a good like two minutes. I was like, hello. I was like, uh, uh -huh. okay. Okay. So I'll just go back and start answering your question is the biggest surprising thing that we see in this space. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So actually the, the biggest thing that I'm surprised at constantly in this space, even after uh, launching my own successful course and seeing it run for a decade and seeing lots of other people do it is actually the number of people in some crazy, uh, all sorts of different course topic areas generating results. So whether it's building your audience, um, even just generating email addresses and, and building that family and audience around you, uh, or leads for your new business and giving away courses for free, or actually generating revenue from your course, I'm constantly surprised by these people coming in and seeing these insane results. Now, I want to be clear, I don't see it as a uh, get rich quick, don't do any work scheme. That when you hear that, generally you should be pretty suspicious. It takes work. It takes work to design a good course, build a good course, and market a good course. But when you do that, and when I see people invest that time, especially on the marketing side, uh, the results I've seen are, are crazy. And I, I love seeing it, but I'm constantly surprised when someone says, hey, I've got this course and I just made, you know, a quarter of a million dollars on it and I've only been up and running for three months. I'm I'm blown away and I think it's just awesome, especially when I see it changing people's lives. So that's really the big thing is, is seeing that that opportunity is huge and that opportunity is there. And I think I'm constantly surprised when I see it, even though it happens all the time now. And I, I think the people creating the courses are constantly surprised when they go, wow, I was kind of expecting this much and, and here we are changing my life. So it's, it's a pretty cool thing to be able to see that all the time. Definitely. I, that's very inspiring. And you've definitely dropped a lot of knowledge bombs here in this interview. And uh, thank you for being patient with all the technical <laughs> 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 
fumbling. It's just, you know, it's tech. Uh, that's why you guys don't see a lot of interviews because it's so hard to, to do the video thing unless you're like in person. Um, but yeah, man, we, we just got back from Seattle. Um, I think Vancouver is going to be on our list next time. So we're going to be around your neck of the woods. Awesome. Uh, maybe for the yeah, next little, yeah, little mini vacay. I think that was awesome. We, uh, it was hot for some reason. But thank you so <laughs> much. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing all of your knowledge on courses. And I hope you guys found it uh, super, super helpful like I did. And um, for everybody to know, where can we find you, Greg? Um, and where can we, we can we reach you? I'm going to close it out uh, with, a, with another solo vid. But where can we find you? Uh, think of is probably the easiest way to get started. And, uh, we'll set, I'll send a link over to you, Meg, as well, that you can share with people to, uh, to find us. Awesome. That sounds good. Thank you so much. And, uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, great. Cool. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to that interview with Greg Smith, the CEO of Thinkific. Um, like I said, they are now the core sponsor for all of the happenings going on here in the lab. You can find out more about that in the links in the description. And um, since you stuck, stuck around to the end, I have a little special something for you. Okay, in honor of uh, Thinkfix sponsoring us, um, we are now able to offer an incredible discount for those of you who want to attend Get in the Lab Live at $97. Okay, so there's a code, there's a special coupon code there for you in the description that you can use when you go buy a ticket on uh, Eventbrite. Okay, so click on that Eventbrite link use that code that I have denoted there in the description and you're going to get a massive discount like $400 off um, all thanks to one of our sponsors think of it okay so good things guys um, and if you don't know anything about getting the lab live um, that is happening August 14th Sunday here in Huntington Beach sunny bright California in August and we're going to be, it's going to be me and a bunch of other speakers. We're going to be talking about how you can uh, grow your business 10x, all right? 10x your business amongst, um, um, amongst other things. All right, so good things, my lab rats. And I will see you next time here, perhaps on the mic. I don't know. We'll, we'll try it out. I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm a video person. So let me know if you liked this type of content. I would appreciate that feedback. And if you would like more of it, I'm happy to do it. I have all the setup. I have the background to do it. But just, you know, I prefer video. So good things. And we'll see you next time here in the lab. Peace out. My name is Meg reminding you to get in the lab.